Well, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, that introduction. Thank you for your prayers, always gratefully received. Um, so uh, I'm going to describe two diseases, neurological diseases, and the impact that they have on people's faith. And uh, I deliberately am going to just describe my own work, the research of my team and I, because I think that has kind of authenticity about it. Uh, and I'm going to take you through the data. Um, I feel most comfortable when I'm telling people about the data. And you may be impressed. You may think it's rather humdrum. That's absolutely fine. I won't be upset at that reaction. But firstly, let me just answer the question, well, why should we do this? Why should we look at the impact of neurological disease on people's faith? Well, firstly, um, I think it's helpful if you yourself were to get a neurological disease, or maybe you have one, to know what impact that might have on your faith. So that's, that's a just being kind to people with neurological diseases. Secondly, I think it's helpful to pastors and those ministering to those folk to know what they might expect. So that's a kindness to pastors uh, and families and carers. But I also want to make another claim, which is uh, really an, a very old claim of neurology, which is that we can learn about the normal functioning of the brain from studying where it goes wrong. And hopefully that will come out in the next uh, half an hour or so. So um, the first disease I want to tell you about is Parkinson's disease. Uh, most people will know someone who has Parkinson's disease. Uh, it tends to be older people, uh, have problems with mobility, perhaps with thinking, um, and appear to be a bit emotionless, uh, face becomes a bit passive, uh, people become a bit apathetic, poor memory, and so on. So uh, what does Parkinson's do to people's faith? Well, if you look it up, uh, you will see these studies, and if you can't see them from the back, that's absolutely fine. Um, if you're a person with Parkinson's disease in the United States, you'll be a given a pamphlet by your patient organization summarizing these studies which says, unfortunately, if you have Parkinson's disease, your faith may suffer. You might find you have less faith as a result of your disease uh, because Parkinson's disease has a specific impact on reducing people's faith, would be what you would read. So uh, we had um, some concerns about these studies, which I'll describe. Uh, and we've done a study ourselves, and you'll see what the outcome is of that. So if you can't see this, don't worry, I'll, let me summarize. So Parkinson's disease has many different things that could impact on face. So one obvious thing is just impaired mobility. So people who can't get out and about so much might not attend church or a synagogue or a mosque just as much as you might expect. Uh, it is true that people with Parkinson's are more inclined to depression, so that might reduce people's excitement and enthusiasm for faith. Uh, it is true that people with Parkinson's have problems with memory and thinking, so that might alter the way they approach a, a very kind of word-based faith, for instance. Um, but the specific claim of American researchers is that Parkinson's disease leads to a selective impairment of faith, selective loss of religiosity. So um, one of the things that uh, we did was review all this literature and we just had a very simple criticism of the controls used in all of the experiments uh, and studies that I've described, whose conclusion I've described. So essentially all those studies are done is taken a group of people with Parkinson's disease and compared them to age-matched healthy people. And there is a big problem with that. Uh, the problem is that there are so many different things, as I've described, that can go wrong in Parkinson's disease, not present in healthy people. So what we did in Cambridge is take a study of 42 people who had Parkinson's disease and 39 people who were the controls who had some difficulty walking. So the idea was to compare two groups of people who had difficulty walking, one of whom had Parkinson's disease and one of group of which had a whole lot of other things wrong with them. Now, if there truly is a selective impairment of religiosity in Parkinson's disease that's distinct and different from an impairment in mobility, you would still see it in that context. Yeah. So 
one of the one of the little riders on all of this is that it's possible when people do research in religion and spirituality to lose their head and start to behave unscientifically. And so what I'm proposing here is that you just go about things in an ordinary way, do science properly, get the right controls. So this is 42 people picked up off the street, as it were, the Parkinson's disease clinic in Cambridge, 39 people in other clinics, not selected for any religious background. So these are your regular United Kingdom citizens. And what we did is we uh, studied them here, and then we studied them a year later, and this provides an internal control as well as an external control. So what we're going to say, what I'll show you, is what has changed in one year of having Parkinson's disease compared to what has changed in one year of having another disease that impacts on mobility. And so this internal control provides some sort of uh, neutralization of all of those random factors uh, that have meant these 42 people have turned up. So if, for instance, uh, they have heart disease or diabetes or something like that, uh, that you hope is relatively static, then the change in a year you would hope you can attribute to Parkinson's disease uh, and get a more selective readout from your data. So how do you measure spirituality? So people have been trying to do this for a long, long time, and there are different ways of measuring it. Uh, this is one uh, that's often used in healthcare studies, uh, and the details aren't important, but just to say, the minute I show you what's in this, you're going to have objections to it. So the minute you start trying to describe or give numbers or categorize religion and spirituality, you come up against problems. So uh, this is a good thing. Uh, so you're not going to be able to read this particularly, but this is just a questionnaire. So I feel God's presence with me or the presence of a higher power many times a day through to never. Uh, I find strength and comfort in my religion many times a day through to never. Negative spiritual experiences. I feel I'm being punished by God a great deal through to not at all. I wonder if I've been abandoned by God a great deal or not at all. I know that I'm forgiven by a higher power or by God, always, never. I've forgiven those who've hurt me, always, never. I've forgiven myself for things I've done wrong, always, never. And so, and so, and so it goes. This is an interesting one. If you were ill, how much would the people in your congregation help you out? A great deal? None. If you had a problem or were faced with a difficult situation, how much comfort would the people in your congregation be willing to give you? A great deal, none. And so on and so forth. And there are lots and lots of these questions. So that's one way that we measure people's religiosity. And then one important thing we wanted to do was measure just how enthusiastic are people about big life goals. Uh, and there's a life goals inventory there. Uh, and I'm going to describe some further scales and so on in a minute. Now, this chart just gives you the values of all of these things between those with Parkinson's who are in grey and those who are controls who are in white, and we've controlled well. So at the start of this experiment, these two groups scored the same on all of these questions. Okay, That was very clever of us, but that was kind of what we intended. So that was good. So here we go. So here's, here's just the data. Uh, so this is looking at mobility and cognitive functions. So the greys are Parkinson's at time zero and a year later. And the whites are, uh, are healthy control, uh, not, sorry, not healthy controls, impaired mobility controls, time zero and a year later. And the bottom line is that the people with Parkinson's disease had a reduction in mobility a year later which is entirely what you'd expect. The people with uh, arthritis and other forms of uh, impaired mobility had no change a year later. Brilliant. This is really good. The people with Parkinson's disease had an impairment of memory a year later. The people with arthritis and other conditions did not have an impairment of memory. Attention was okay. Planning uh, was okay. So this is nicely set up now. So what we're going to ask is, the Parkinson's patients nicely matched have impairment and mobility after a year, those uh, controls are flattened 
flat out, no change after a year, what's going to be the difference in their spirituality scores? There is no difference in the Parkinson's patients in any of the spirituality scores. The only difference we found, bizarrely, was a slight reduction in the total religiosity score of the mobility-matched controls. So this study, in its little way, has shown that if you properly control, you do not see a selective impairment of religiosity in Parkinson's disease. You do not see that. And in fact, if you track all the previous literature that has made that claim, you can see within the data that what's happened is that those people with Parkinson's go to church or synagogue or mosque less than healthy controls, and that gives them a lower spirituality score. But if you match them with people who struggle to get out of the house for other reasons, they're equal. So this is really good news for people with Parkinson's disease. And if you now have Parkinson's disease in the UK, you'll get a leaflet which says, Parkinson's disease will not impact on your faith. Now, you may think that this data is rather thin, and I would agree with you. And one of the things, one of the important uh, research strategies, it's rather pompous, but there you are, is that we're very keen to get people's subjective experience. So we, we have a, a parallel stream where we simply ask people at interviews, semi-structured interviews, what they experience. Don't worry if you can't read this. But remember, these are all people who, do, who weren't selected on the grounds of having any particular faith. So most of the participants said that their faith or lack of it had not changed. Three out of the 42 patients with Parkinson's felt that they had been abandoned by God or blamed God for their illness. Three out of 42. It's easy to think you've kind of been abandoned and then another day you'll think, well, thank goodness you do believe that something is there because da 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 One participant who had previously been agnostic said that his spirituality had increased. It's made me more interested because sooner or later it's going to get worse and I need to find some way of coping. We did get a clear impression that the physical impairments of Parkinson's disease did have an impact negatively before I can meditate all day, but now less. Sitting is just sitting is hard with the shaking, the dyskinesia, the shaking. But even so, I want to try it. It does help. And this is a Buddhist speaking um, who had previously attended temple and now is unable to attend temple. Now, that's an interesting statement because it summarizes both the difficulties of the practice of religion, uh, in this case meditation, but also a persistent desire to continue to have that experience. I want to try it. It does help. Most Parkinson's patients indicated that existential questions about the existence or not of God were important to them. For instance, I know there's a God. I'm trying to prove to myself where he is, what he is, where he came from, and whether he cares about us. There's a lot out there. A lot of religions give you a lot of insight into spirituality. I believe I'm not alone. I'm not doing this myself. You know, I've sat there and said, well, I've got these things. I can either sit down and cry and rail and rant at the world and say, why me? Or I can think, well, I've been given them for a reason. I don't know what the reason is. I may find out one day. I may not. I believe I will. But I don't think I've been given anything that I can't cope with. I'm always conscious that there's someone there to whom I can, whom I can raise my problems with. Yes, it would be very much a loss without that. It's an anchor. It helps me through difficult times. It's a good feeling, I think, to have a belief. Because otherwise you've got nothing. And I think you see in those little snippets the richness of people's experience of having neurological disease and through that facing new questions or revisiting old questions about whether a God exists or not, whether there's anything out there. I was really encouraged by the results of these questionnaires because it implied that times of having something like Parkinson's disease were times of spiritual 
searching, albeit with those practical difficulties. So the implications are, if you're a pastor of a church, and one of your congregations get Parkinson's disease and stops coming to the church, it's because you, the congregation, have let that person down. Because the main reason, almost certainly why they're not coming, is because they just can't get to church. So sort it out. It isn't because they've lost interest in their faith. If you're the Church of England, vicar of a parish, and you have people developing Parkinson's disease in your parish, which you will have, they will be searching. And maybe you're the right person to offer them some solution. So do you know who they are? How are you going to find that out? Do you have access to those people? Challenging questions for the vicar of a parish in that context. So, concluding on Parkinson's disease, contrary to everything that's been written before, we believe that just with this little study, well controlled, we do not see a specific deficit of religiosity with Parkinson's disease. Open brackets, why on earth would you? Close brackets. Uh, and instead, all of the deficits that have been measured are perfectly explicable. Uh, and anecdotally, for some of our participants, spirituality provided solace to their situation, but nearly all of them had an interest, a new interest or an interest reawakened in considering whether or not there was a God, whether there was something out there. And that's an opportunity, an opportunity to be taken attractively, carefully, reasonably. And just on a personal level, um, uh, as a doctor seeing people with neurological disease like Parkinson's disease, I think it's very, very reasonable and indeed appropriate and good medical practice to ask a question like, do you have a, a resource at home? Do you have uh, something at home that will help you understand the bigger significance of what's happening to you? Uh, a question like that, which might well open into a discussion of spirituality. I think that's good practice. Okay, so what I wanted to spend more time on was something that's a bit more sort of dramatic, uh, much rarer, but potentially has more to say. Uh, and that is the, uh, the entity of mystical seizures. Now, this comes with a, a health warning. Um, and the health warning is this, I'm about to talk about epilepsy and one very, very rare and specific form about, of it. But I do not want anyone to in any way think that I think having epilepsy is a good thing. Um, and uh, for most people with epilepsy, it's a bad thing, uh, most people, in that it uh, leads to a, a reduction in the ability to work, to form relationships, to achieve all one's hopes and dreams. So that's, please don't let me be misunderstood in what I'm about to say. So what I want to talk about is the very rare form of epilepsy where people have a mystical experience as a result of the seizure. So to remind you, epilepsy is a disease caused by excessive positive electrical activity in the brain. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with epilepsy, probably the only thing you will know about is on the television, people falling to the ground and shaking. It's very dramatic. And that's when there's an electrical discharge over the whole of the brain. But it is possible to have epileptic seizures due to a positive abnormal discharge in just one part of the brain. So, for instance, if I had an epileptic discharge here over the right motor strip, that might be manifest just by twitching of the thumb on the other side. Uh, that's not very interesting. But you could, for instance, have uh, visions, seeing things that aren't there because of electrical activity in the uh, occipital lobe, that part of the brain that controls vision, and so on and so forth. So for people like me, uh, from a research point of view, bearing in mind the health warning I gave you. What's exciting about epilepsy, and particularly focal epilepsy, is it allows you to see what different parts of the brain are responsible for. If you study the effects of focal abnormal electrical activity in one part of the brain. 
And the most interesting, from my point of view, are these mystical seizures. So a particular part of the brain is triggered and people have mystical experiences. And the best description of these is in the uh, book by Dostoevsky, uh, The Idiot, in which the main um, uh, character of the book, Prince Mishkin, has epilepsy uh, and he has these seizures. There was a moment or two just before the fit when suddenly amid the sadness, the spiritual darkness and depression, his, that's Prince Mishkin's brain, seemed to catch fire and all his doubts and worries seemed composed in a twinkling, culminating in a great calm, full of sense and harmonious joy and hope. A blinding inner light flooded his soul. And this is a really good description of the sort of seizures that we're going to be talking about. So this is a very positive experience for Prince Mishkin. And for those of you who haven't read the book, I'd really encourage you to read it because controversially, excitingly, Prince Mishkin is a sort of Jesus uh, figure within the book. He is morally perfect and he's sort of crucified at the end. And it's very challenging that Dostoevsky gives him this form of epilepsy. Now, I'll give you another example. So, uh, late at night, on an online chat room for people with a specific form of epilepsy, uh, I read this. So, there's a timeline here. Um, this is a person online describing their experience of having a seizure at that time. So 20 past midnight, it's going to be a bad one. The slow burn is the worst. 21 minutes past midnight. It was the smell that told me. I smell things like burning herbs. Then they go, and when it's over, they're gone. Eight minutes later, I can feel fragments of identity speaking to me. It gets harder to describe. I taste salt and something else. Now, for those of you in the know, you'll have twigged. This is someone who's having a temporal lobe seizure with altered... Uh, smell and altered taste. So that's a focal seizure arising from the temporal lobe on one side. And they go on and they describe what it feels like. So most of their brain is healthy and well and is experiencing what the abnormal electrical activity in the temporal lobe is projecting. So one person but a healthy person experiencing their own abnormal brain activity. I exult in these moments. It's the payoff for the bad times, the weary times. In these moments, I kiss God. I can see all the colors now, and the grammar starts to break down. Under your skin, look at your hand. Do you doubt that you can contain an infinity of shades? Tone and chroma, chapter and verse. You are the book of madder rose and indigo. Grammar's gone. My hands will be taken soon for a while, but how lovely that I can speak colour with my hands while the time lasts. It's coming, I break open like a chrysalis, I split, can't say much more, but you are the divine. Look at your hands, draw breath, spelt wrong, and do not doubt that you taste eternity. Over soon, I would be a river if I could, I would bleed eternal divine. Now, all colours, da-da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da-da, an hour later, it's over, I had the fit, I'm fine, except I think I hit my elbow on something and I bit my tongue. So that prolonged description was the description of what it's like to feel a temporal lobe, epileptic seizure, and then that electrical activity spread to cause a generalized seizure, the one that you've seen on the telly where you fall to the floor and convulse. Obviously, this is a nasty thing to happen but it's a fantastic insight, potentially, into what that part of the temporal, do temporal lobe does in normal, healthy brains. The brains that you and I have, potentially, could be stimulated to give exactly this experience that you're hearing described. So, uh, again, returning to, to data. So... Uh, no one has actually studied these mystical seizures in a systematic way. So we set out to uh, identify people who had these and we had some questions. We wondered if there was a specific place in the brain where they came from. 
we wondered if these mystical seizures was the same as normal religious mystical experiences. Uh, and we had some thoughts about prior religious upbringing. So how did we get hold of these uh, patients with mystical seizures? Well, we went to uh, the National Hospital for Neurology, that's Queen Square, and they have a database of people with epilepsy. Uh, we went to epilepsy clinics and gave questionnaires which sort of said, have you had unusual experiences and do you want to tell us about them? Uh, and then people came to us directly. And we looked at 128 records of people with epilepsy uh, at the National Hospital, Queen Square, um, and of those, roughly half of them had temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, and unusual experiences documented in the database were 67. So we had 67 potential people emerging from these databases. We asked their consultants if we could talk to the 67, and they only let us approach 12. So 67 potential, we were only allowed to speak to 12, and of those 12, none agreed to see us. So this was quite a lot of effort for no outcome, literally no outcome. Um, now what was interesting is that two people who later described very clearly mystical seizures were in this database and had not told any of their medical carers about these unusual experiences. And this turned out to be a big theme, that people with epilepsy who have unusual experiences, particularly of a religious or uh, quasi-religious nature, do not tell their doctors. And their doctors certainly don't want to know about it and they don't ask about it. And if it's brought up, as we did here, they're kind of embarrassed and prevent us from going into it. So there's a big problem there that we revealed. So uh, we then did, uh, we had this survey, uh, so people filled in anonymously a survey, and we had various scales on this, so this is the Hood Mysticism Scale, uh, it's a long name for a rather short scale. Things like, I've had an experience which was timeless and spaceless. I have experienced profound joy. Various questions like this, and you can, you can, uh, um, you can quantify people on this scale. And out of 309, we identified four people who had high scores on this scale who agreed to be interviewed. Right, we had lots more people who are high on the scale but didn't want to go any further. So we've got four patients. Amen. This is three years in. Now, along the way, we did a number of talks and things a bit like tonight. Uh, and we actually got four people from audiences of our talk self-refer, saying that they had mystical seizures. So it's actually incredibly difficult now to say how common these are, because by taking a conventional approach of looking at an epilepsy database, we would say they're very rare. But by giving talks and people self-referring, we'd say, well, actually, it's much more common than you might think. So we're really stuck as to know how common this is. And, uh, these are the descriptions of the patients, and I don't want to sort of go into great detail here other than to say that we have some people who have a, a benign brain tumour who have had one or two seizures and then a fine on an anti-epilepsy drug. And then we have some people who've had three brain operations to remove the site of uh, the cause of a seizure and yet are still having several seizures a day. So we have the full gamut of people from minimally affected to really majorly affected in this. Now, we collected up now eight patients, that's all we have. So we studied them quite intensely and one of the things that we asked ourselves is, is there something unusual about these people that makes them more prone to interpreting these experiences as mystical or spiritual, where other people might interpret them in other ways, much more prosaic ways. And we had, a, we had a, this, my psychology colleague working on this, uh, had a hypothesis that these people might be more likely to be absorbed in things than others. So this is an absorption scale. So you basically you take your idea and you add the word scale to it, then you come up with a list of questions and hey-ho, off you go. So 
Are you someone who can watch a movie, TV show or play and become so involved in it that you forget where you are, you forget your surroundings and you experience the story as real? And there are people who kind of find themselves drawn into the screen and they're so absorbed by it that they feel part of it. And there are other people who all the time are disengaged and of course there are people in between. Um, I sometimes step outside of my usual self and experience a completely different state of being is another sort of question. And you can imagine yourself answering these questions with various sort of grades and things. Uh, and then there's a, a, a spiritual transcendent scale, which is just how transcendent do I feel. So, here's some data. So this is the eight people who had mystical seizures. This is seven healthy religious controls who were all ordinands at a uh, college of Anglican ministry formation. And this is 263 unselected me uh, members of the, um, of the UK population. So I'm going to go through the data in a moment, but just want to grab your attention here. So now we have this really interesting group of people. We have the ordinary British solid punter. We can rely on him and her. Then we have these slightly dodgy seven ordinands in a Church of England ministry formation. So how wacky are they? And then we have these really unusual group of people who are experiencing God several times a day through their seizures or have had a time where they've experienced God several times a day, unprovoked, as it were, outside of any religious context. So... Are these eight more religious or less religious? Do these eight lead a more religious life or a less religious life than the ordinance, than the honest British punter? So these are the sort of questions that we were interested in finding out. And I suppose the sort of bigger story is how important is religious experience? So if it's good to experience God once or twice in your life, which is the average UK figure, in the sense of a mystical, numinous experience. Why not experience him three or four times a day? Does that make it even better? So that's the sort of question we're asking. So, uh, the really interesting thing is that those people who were experiencing God through seizures had a very high score on the absorption scale, very prone to get absorbed compared to the UK punter. The Anglican ordinands were less likely to get absorbed. Obviously, now quite suspicious of any nonsense like that. The, those people with uh, mystical seizures had a very high score on spiritual transcendence, as did your UK punter, as did not the healthy religious ordinance. <laughs> really interesting. So uh, I've got a little rider on this, but uh, about 25% uh, um, of your average UK population unselected out there will be completely comfortable with you talking about them experiencing a higher power, being on another plane, having communed with God, knowing God. 25% of the unselected population. So if you're the vicar of a rural parish, you have 25% of people already on your side at one level. Yeah, I and mean, that's not how vicars of rural parishes always behave. So it's an interesting point. Now, I think the reason why the religious controls scored low on this scale is because they were very suspicious about these questions. And there were a lot of uh, responses that were long theological diatribes. So, you know, do you, do you, have you ever experienced a higher power? Well, what exactly do you mean? <laughs> yes, yes, you know. Uh, and then, you know, lots of... Lots of uh, stern quotations. Uh, so I think, that, I think that's an artificially low figure because people sense they were trying to be tricked in some way or tested, which wasn't the point. Now half, uh, well, sorry, are, are, 
our patients with mystical seizures had a very high spiritual transcendence score. Um, they uh, were almost all believers in some rather chaotic, sort of non-conformist religious philosophy. So although they uh, described themselves as Christian, agnostic, spiritual, uh, none of them had a conventional or orthodox religious faith. They didn't attend places of worship in any method, any systematic way. Uh, but then, of course, their life was pretty chaotic generally because of being interrupted with these seizures. Um, but interestingly, they did these experiences did lead to some sense of being part of a big uh, religious, spiritual thing. Now, one of the questions that we wondered about was whether these group of eight would be distinguished by having had a very fervent religious upbringing. So perhaps uh, they interpreted these events as religious or mystical uh, because they'd had some teaching in the past about how God would speak to them. And five out of the eight, which would be above average, but these are small numbers, had had uh, quite a religious home. So let me just give you uh, some of the descriptions of these, these people about their experiences. And I want you to just hark back to what you heard from Dostoevsky and Prince Mishkin and that online chat. I don't know it's vivid, it's more colourful and it's safe when you're not boxed in, so where you can be free. So it's almost like I'm in a place where there's water, where it's not like a desert island, but almost just like a sanctuary. When I started to have the epilepsy and the seizures, I used to spend a lot of time just sitting in churches and talking to people and lighting candles because I found it very moving, but a very comforting place. You don't necessarily have to be going every week, but it's quite nice to go. I used to get to definitely go to, and this is in the seizures, an eastern country, and it used to definitely be a country where there are lots of sands, and the woman would have, the woman definitely wore veils, and the women were definitely in trouble and needed help, which is really bizarre, and I'd be there to help them. No, it just felt good to be just sort of zone out and just be there into this different place, and it was a really lovely experience. So people with epilepsy don't normally say this of just being travelling and being taken out of it all like a body experience and to be somewhere else. And I haven't had these for a year since I've been on topiramate, which is a drug for epilepsy. Uh, so our interviewer says, does that frustrate you that you've been on this drug? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I even waited to see if I could get one, and I haven't. And later on discloses that she stopped taking her anticonvulsant drugs in order to re-experience these. And a really sad part of this story is that one of our eight died having stopped taking the epilepsy drugs uh, for his seizures. I imagine, he didn't say to anyone, but I imagine it was because uh, he found these experiences so positive that he wanted to have them again. So that's a really important message, uh, particularly for my colleague neurologists, that if you don't inquire about the content of the epileptic seizures, it's possible you'll be missing this small group of people who are finding them positive and therefore at high risk of stopping their, their treatment. It seemed I was woken up really by the sunlight. I would have had a tremendous sense of joy. And I remember that my first memory of it was just feeling absolutely astounded at just the presence of the things around me, the world around me. I remember feeling that just the wall above my hospital bed was extraordinary just for being there. So this is a description of a man who uh, went abroad on holiday and unfortunately was found to have a brain tumour during the holiday and had it removed. And as part of his post-operative experience, he had some seizures, which would not be unusual, but they were mystical seizures, which he interpreted in this very positive ways. I think one of the strongest things about it for me was that it was very comforting. It was very moving. I was crying really because it was so moving and I did have a sense that this indicated me that there was a continuity beyond death. I couldn't say that there was a sense of it being God as such in the conventional sense or in the Christian sense of being God. 
because there was no distinction between the source of the unconditional love and the universe itself. It was all bound together. Now these descriptions, I don't know if you agree with me, are quite reminiscent of some of the mystics in the way they describe uh, light and joy and peace, a sense of unity, uh, a sense of being comforted, a sense of this being a gift. Um, and uh, in, in our analysis so far, these would fit with the sorts of words and phrases people use when they're describing a religious experience and they don't have epilepsy. Um, this uh, person definitely experienced these seizures as a gift of comfort to being abroad, having been diagnosed with a brain tumour. It's a positive experience. So, let me just come to a conclusion, and we're nearly done. So, we're the first people to attempt to find this group of people with mystical seizures. They are hard to get hold of. Uh, they're probably a rare group, but I can't say how rare. Um, the implications for neurologists is that most of them had temporal lobe involvement uh, and that the patients will not tell you as a neurologist what they're experiencing, uh, but because of the pleasure they get from it, they may uh, not comply with treatment and in one tragic case, that may lead to death. Um, I think the challenge that these experiences have for the theologians or people of faith is how similar the descriptions are to the uh, descriptions people without epilepsy will have of their numinous experience. And that implies, perhaps, that there is a module within the temporal lobe that, once activated, will give this rather patterned uh, universal experience. It's neither positive nor negative uh, when it's triggered by an epileptic seizure, perhaps, but it allows us to believe that there's a substrate sitting there that will allow us to experience the divine. Now, you may interpret that as uh, the means by which God can allow himself to be experienced. Uh, but that, of course, goes beyond what we can say today. Now, one of the really challenging things for me, and I'm going to finish nearly on time, just one minute over, uh, and this is what I hope we can bring up in discussion, is that I'm very clear that this epilepsy that these people are experiencing is bad because it's a disease that's arisen from and causing damage to the brain. That's my training. And I do my best to try and stop these seizures happening. However, the people experiencing them who know that it's epilepsy, who know that they've got brain damage because it's visible on the scan, and indeed will have brain operations to try and get rid of these seizures experience them as positive things in their life. The one who had a brain tumour, will talk about this as being one of the most positive, fulfilling and goal-driving experiences in his life. It caused him to turn his life around. So God authentically has spoken to them through their disease, they would say. So I... Uh, William James was challenged by something similar. You'll remember he's the father of psychology and he wrote this wonderful book on the varieties of religious experience. Uh, and he ended up saying, you just cannot tell from people's experience or the brain state whether it's from God or not. You can only tell from the fruits. And that, of course, is what our scriptures tell us. And I'd love to talk more in questions about that afterwards. What were the fruits? of these experiences. And the very last thing, just the denouement, is that the reason Dostoevsky could write so convincingly about these seizures is because he had them himself. This was the form of epilepsy that Dostoevsky had, and he wrote to his brother Louis, you have no idea what joy that joy is which we epileptics experience. I do not know whether it lasts for seconds or hours or months, but I would not exchange it for all the delights of this world. Tantalizing, 
that even such a rational and great man as Dostoevsky, knowing this to be a disease, nonetheless draws this huge significance from it. So, two minutes over, sorry. Thank you for watching. You can discover other events similar to these by following the link below. And you can stay updated with all the latest from LICC by subscribing to our emails. And you can also like and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.